So question and answer 26, and I'll read the question. We'll all confess the answer together. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father for the sake of Christ his Son. I trust God so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul, and will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends upon me in this veil of tears. He is able to do this because he is almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful father. You may be seated. And as well, before we hear from what, what God has for us tonight, from his word and from our catechism, let's turn to him in prayer. Illumine our hearts, O God, with the pure radiance of your spirit. Open our eyes to the beauty of your gospel and transform us by the light of Christ, that we may think and do things that are pleasing in your sight. Unto you only do we ascribe glory, together with the Holy Spirit and your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know what you were doing in 2008. But I know that at least one night that year, I was watching the television show, My Dad is Better Than Your Dad, which might sound like a made-up show. I'm sure nobody else in here has seen it. I wouldn't recommend seeking it out because it wasn't very good. It got canceled after only 10 episodes. But in this show, kids would come on with their fathers and their dads would compete in all these little contests to see whose dad was fastest whose dad was strongest, whose dad was smartest, these sorts of things. But it's playing on this idea that we have in common human experience that when they're little, children think that their parents are like these superheroes. They're the tallest people they know, they're the strongest people they know, and they have all the answers to all the questions that the kids have, right? But, of course, children grow up and they realize their parents aren't superheroes, they're actually normal people, and they have normal strengths and, and normal weaknesses, and actually the moment a child realizes that can be quite a painful experience, but thankfully Christians never have to experience that moment when we think that our fathers have flaws, because our Heavenly Father has no flaws, He is perfect, unlike our earthly parents and he'll never let us down. That's something that question uh, 26 makes sure we understand. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the creator of all things, is also our Father, and that comes with special advantages and responsibilities. So that's what we'll focus on tonight. But to set up that idea, if you'd please turn with me first to Isaiah 44, and we'll look at verses 24 through 28 particularly at the doctrines of creation and providence. Isaiah 44, verses 24 through 28, is a passage intended for the original Israelite audience to assure them of God's good intentions for them, providing them this assurance by declaring God's power as creator and as king over that creation. So, Isaiah 44, 24 through 28. Isaiah writes this, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, She shall be inhabited. And of the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise their ruins. Who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. 
So the first thing this passage highlights is also the first thing discussed in our catechism question this evening, that the eternal father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the creator of heaven and earth and everything in them, and he did this out of nothing. God declares through Isaiah, it is I, Yahweh, who made everything. It's hard to come up with a more clear and concise statement than that. We look at all the stuff around us in this world, and we ask ourselves, how did it get here? How did we get here? And the answer is God. Uh, I'm working on, uh, Cassidy and I are, are working on this children's catechism with Henry right now, my oldest, who's three. And I ask him all the time, the second question in this little kid's catechism is, um, what else did God make? The first question is, who made you? God. What else did God make? And the answer in the catechism is everything. But with Henry, you never know what he's going to say. Uh, it's basically the first thing that comes to mind. So we ask, Henry, what else did God make? Well, this rock, uh, that bug we saw earlier today, um, our coffee table. And he's right. I mean, he's right. He, he doesn't say the word that the catechism says is the answer, everything, but he understands the concept. He can look at everything around him and know that God is the creator of all the things in this world uh, that he sees. We'll kind of work on agency and secondary causes later. But right now, he gets the concept. God is the creator of everything. Everything that exists is because of God, no exceptions. This is wonderful, but surely, the neighbors of Israel would say, surely some other gods were there and they helped Yahweh with this process. But God says, no, he did not have any help. He alone stretched out the heavens, unaided, he spread out the earth. Whatever those other nations' gods might be, one thing we know for certain is that they had nothing to do with bringing about the existence of the world. So how does the doctrine of creation build Israel's confidence in their God? That's the point of this passage, is to give them assurance of his good intentions for them. Well, it's exactly as question 26 teaches. God still upholds and rules heaven and earth and everything in them by his eternal counsel and providence. As creator of all, God is the ruler of all. He holds full power over everything in heaven and earth because he made everything in heaven and on earth. But what about sorcerers, fortune tellers, psychics, prognosticators? Don't they have some influence over this world and its events? Did Aleister Crowley really win World War II for the Allies? Do you know this story? This is an insane story. Uh, there was uh, this prominent British occultist in the 20th century named Aleister Crowley. Crazy guy. But he said that he came up with the V for victory symbol, this thing that you do with your fingers that Winston Churchill made famous. And it, w it really was this morale boost for the Allied forces and was used a lot. But Crowley said that it was a magical symbol that ultimately affected the victory of the Allies over the Nazi regime, this magical symbol. Is there anything to this? Is he right? Did this sign really work a magical effect on reality and history? In Isaiah 44, God says, no. Magic, divination, the power of positive thinking Mindfulness, these sorts of things have no power. There's no way for us as creatures to affect, control our fellow creation. And as Pastor Danny mentioned this morning, there's also no way for us to use creation or ourselves to manipulate God. Only the creator has sovereign power over the creation. So if we want to know anything about the future, we should look to God's word spoken through his prophets. Verse 26 says, God confirms the word of his servants and fulfills the prediction of his messengers. It's God's word that is truth. So if we want knowledge, if we want wisdom, we turn to Isaiah and to the other authors of scripture. We turn to the Bible. That's where we'll find God's word preserved for us even to this day. But what was God's word for Israel in that day? What was he telling them as they were hearing Isaiah's prophecy? Simply put, it was that he would not forsake them. Jerusalem shall be inhabited, and Jerusalem and Judah shall be rebuilt. God reminds Israel in their doubt 
of the way that he brought them out of bondage in Egypt. Verse 27 is alluding to that Exodus event. I who said to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your floods. If God can dry up the great Red Sea so that his people can cross safely, he can do anything he wants with his creation for his purposes. In the last verse of the passage, verse 28, we find amazing evidence of God's control over history. The events predicted in this verse did not take place for 200 years after they were written. And Cyrus is mentioned by name. And this isn't because Isaiah was edited later. This isn't because it was written after the fact. Rather, this is proof of God's great power and majesty. He is the covenant Lord who can and does keep his promises, and he directs all human history for that purpose. And his will, his purpose, as we see here in Isaiah 44 and throughout the rest of the scriptures, is to redeem a people for himself, to save people from their sins, to adopt them into his family. That brings us to what we mainly want to focus on tonight. God is not only the creator and king over all creation, he's also our loving and faithful heavenly father. As question 26 says, the eternal father of our Lord Jesus Christ is my God and father for the sake of Christ his son. We are adopted because of what Christ did. This truth is expressed throughout the New Testament, but one of the clearest uh, examples we find is in Galatians 4 where Paul says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So that's the case for all who trust in Jesus. We are his brothers and sisters, and we are children of God the Father. The rest of the answer to question 26 explains the implications of that, the marvelous ways that being God's children affects our lives. Let's turn to Matthew 7 now as we think about God's fatherly care for us. Matthew 7, and I'll be reading verses 7 through 11. Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So these verses are about prayer. This is what Jesus is teaching his disciples about, prayer. Uh, He commands them to pray in verse 7 with these three different ways of picturing prayer, um, telling his disciples, that they must move through life as the kind of people who talk to God. We must ask him, petition him for the things that we need. We must seek him and knock at the door of his heavenly throne room. And then in verse 8, Jesus assures them that with God, asking, seeking, and knocking will actually work. And then verses 9 through 11 explain why. So prayer is a topic the catechism is going to take up later. We'll spend a lot of time uh, thinking about prayer later this year. What I want to focus on tonight is why we are encouraged to pray. And that's seen in verses 9 through 11 as Jesus uses what's called an argument from the lesser to the greater. And the argument works like this. If God is a father, it must be the case that he is a better father than sinful human fathers. It must be. So we survey the world around us, and what do we find? We find that in most cases, parents wouldn't dream of giving their children something harmful when they ask for something they need. This is certainly not to say human parents are incapable of abuse or neglect. That is true, and that's one of the most heartbreaking, sinful realities that we have to live with in this sin-cursed age. But what Jesus is working with here is our assumption of what parenting should look like. We know that parents shouldn't give their children barbed wire and fireworks when they ask for toys to play with. We know that when our kids are cold, we don't give them blankets laced with poison ivy. Right? These are ridiculous examples I'm using, but that's, that's what Jesus did in this story as well. He's making this point that if we know parents shouldn't act in these ways, how much more can God the one who is not evil but who is perfect in righteousness and holiness, be trusted to meet the needs of his children. 
So in this passage, Jesus emphasizes our Heavenly Father's eagerness to give us good things. And he guarantees, as we seek him in prayer, that those good things will be given to us. At this point, it's wise to remember the clarification provided by our catechism in this regard. In question 26, we confess, I trust God so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul. It, in many ways, we are swimming in a sea of confusion in our culture. Uh, in America, the list is long of things we're confused about, but certainly one thing we could put on that list is the difference between needs and desires. We're bombarded from every angle and at every hour with corporations and their advertising teams telling us that we need the products and services and goods that they offer us. And because none of our digital data is private, they can target it to specifically you. They know who you are, they know what you're doing, they know what you like, and they think that they can turn what you like into a need so they can sell you something. This is the world we live in, and that being the case, our perception of what we need is skewed. Even if we know we don't need all the things we're told we need, still the bar is set too high. Most Americans have televisions, air conditioning, smartphones, cars, indoor plumbing. These are things we take for granted. And I'm definitely not saying get rid of these things, but I'm saying that none of these things are needs. I'm a, Jesus is trying to adjust our expectations. All we really need are the basics, water, food, and shelter. And the catechism says, not just the needs of our body, but our soul. As children of God, He's already met our primary need, spiritually speaking, by reconciling us to him, solving this, the problem of our sin, our rebellion against him. But he still provides for our spiritual needs. By the love that we have received in Christ, he's transforming us into the kind of people who love and obey him and love and serve those around us. So God is the creator and the king over all creation, and he is our father because of Jesus Christ. But before we close tonight, I'd like to highlight four implications of what it means to have God as our Father. Being in Christ and being his adopted brothers and sisters comes with special privileges and duties, special advantages that then are the foundation of special obligations. So we'll start with the advantages. <clears throat> And the one that comes through loud and clear in the passage we just looked at, Matthew 7, is that God, as our Father, hears and answers our prayers. The Lord looks with pleasure on our childlike askings of him, on our complaints, on our babbling to him, so to speak. He wants us to turn to him for refuge in all situations in life. And when we do, he will surely answer us and provide for all of our needs spiritual and physical. The second special advantage of being God's children is what question 26 mostly focuses on, that God will turn to our good whatever adversity he sends upon us. Nothing happens to us by chance. This is especially true with our trials and sufferings. The same Father who's given us every spiritual blessing in Christ and who has promised to us that he will meet all of our needs is the same Father who sends grief and suffering and death our way. Of course, these hard providences, as we've seen as reading through the book of Job in the evenings, these are much more difficult to accept. We often respond rightly like the psalmist. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Wake up. Don't reject me forever. Why do you look the other way and ignore the way I'm oppressed and mistreated? These kind of cries to God of our confusion and explaining how we feel, these are well within bounds, and I think it's wise to use psalms like this to express our feelings to the Lord. I think that's why he's given them to us. But when we're tempted to go one step further and curse God in our suffering and pain, as Job's wife advised him to do, we must remember that we cannot measure God by our own standards. He does not do what we want him to do, but he always does what is good and right. And he has good reasons for everything that he does, even though those reasons for us remain mysterious. Maybe he's humbling us through adversity. Maybe he sent tribulations our way to wean us from the world. 
Maybe he's brought about suffering in our life so that we would trust him more and and turn to him more. These are reasons we might guess based on the testimony of scripture and things he has revealed to us. But ultimately, we'll never know the reason why this or that particular trial has come into our life. And we shouldn't try to find out. It's not our business. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our descendants forever. So while we don't know why God sends evil upon us, we do know who he is. He's the one who created all things and still rules all things. He is our heavenly father who loves us, who loves us so much, even in our rebellion that he sent his only son into the world, not to condemn the world, but so the world might be saved through him. Jesus obeyed in our place and died in our place and was raised as our guarantee of eternal life with him, all because God loved us. So whatever we suffer in this life, we cannot measure against what we expect of God, what we think he should do for us, but we measure it against what he has done for us and how he has loved us in Jesus Christ. So those are the two special advantages I wanted to highlight of being God's children, that he hears and answers our prayers and that he turns to our advantage, to our good, whatever adversity he sends upon us. The question then naturally follows, since we enjoy these great blessings as God's children, what are the responsibilities that come with having God as our Father? As we're renewed by his Spirit, how can we show our gratitude to him and live lives that are pleasing to him? The first special responsibility goes with the first advantage. Pray. We are responsible to pray. Ask your heavenly Father for everything that you desire. Anything you need, let him know. Whatever you're lacking, whatever's stressing you out, whatever feels threatening to you, whatever you wish to have, pray about these things because he's promised that he will give you all good things and provide for your every need. And pray like a child would ask his father. I think of that famous picture of John F. Kennedy working at his desk with his son playing under the desk in the Oval Office. Why did he feel comfortable enough to do that? This is the President of the United States we're talking about. This is where important business is done, in the Oval Office. Well, it's because his kid didn't think of him as the President of the United States. He thought of him as his dad. He felt welcome, comfortable, and safe in that space. A traitorous spy who'd been caught selling information to the Soviets would not feel that way if he was brought into the Oval Office before the president because he'd done something wrong and he knew he was culpable for it and he knew he'd be punished for it. But we're not in that position anymore. We were sinful traitors, not just to the president of the United States, but to the creator and ruler of all creation. But now we've been made his children. And therefore, when we pray... We should not come to him trembling and hesitant. Instead, we should use the boldness we have received to cry out, Abba, Father. And as we pray to him in this way, we believe he will answer us. Jesus has promised he will grant us all good things. The second special responsibility that comes with being God's child is to trust in him. Place everything we have, all of our fears and anxieties, All of our joys and pleasures, our entire body and soul, our whole lives in his hands and trust him to care for us. This is a hard thing to do. One reason is because we operate a lot of times with the illusion that we are in ultimate control of our lives. We're the captain of our own destiny. Another reason this is hard to do is because we might doubt we really belong to God as his children. We might still operate under fear and hesitancy that we're condemned and not realizing that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We might also doubt his goodness and that he actually does what is best for us, even when that doesn't seem like what's best for us. So these doubts and these temptations come, but how do we build our trust in our Heavenly Father? How do we give over to him our entire lives? Well, the answer is certainly not within us. We don't simply resolve to trust him more. That will never work. Rather, we must hear God's promises coming from the outside to us through his word. God sees. He takes notice of trouble and suffering and is always ready to help. The helpless commit themselves to him. He has always helped the needy. 
Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. We can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? All of these words from God's written and inspired word are for you tonight. This is what your Father in heaven says to you. So trust in him. He is the creator and ruler of all. He has loved you from before the foundation of the world. He sent his son to bring you into his family. And for those who are his children, who live in his household, all will be well. Why? Because he is almighty God, because he is a faithful father. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, thank you for this encouraging word to us tonight. May we take it to heart, remembering your sovereign power over the world you've created, this universe you've brought about unaided. But let our consideration of your great might not drive us to terror, but to comfort. For you have taught us that your providential rule of this world is a reason for your children to rejoice. You turn all things to our good, even the abundant and varied evil we face. You do this because you are our Father. We may come to you as such in our personal prayers and our prayers together. Let the assurance of your power and your kind disposition toward us motivate us to pray more. And as we do so, to entrust ourselves to you more and more. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.